Warm greetings from Creative Hub Tallinn, Estonia. This webinar is organized by Education Nation, which is an Estonian initiative to share our educational knowledge and experience with the world. Estonia has the top education results, number one in PISA in Europe, and it's known for its e-services. We aim to share that experience with the world. Every Thursday, we host a free online webinar to offer support for all of those affected by the current COVID-19 coronavirus crisis, and as a result, switching to online education. Estonia, the leading education nation in Europe, has become a role model for digital education. The main discussion today will be around the Estonian distance learning practices in higher education. During the webinar, we share tips on how to manage remote learning for universities and how to support students and staff. We also introduce two edtech startups changing the face of education, DreamApply and Guana. After the speakers, we will hold also a Q&A session. For more information, go to Facebook and find out the page from Education Nation and group named Remote Learning Education Nation. In addition to our six speakers today, we encourage your participation as well for asking your questions. Please just comment on the live stream either on the Education Nation YouTube channel or Facebook Live. Our speakers today, Karl Kruzima, Associate Professor of Robotics, Engineering, University of Tartu. Marek Link, uh, Rector, the Estonian Academy of Security Science. Gerhard Lok, BFM Lecturer of Musicology and Multimedia, Tallinn University. And also Elleri Billirok, Chairperson of the Board of Federation of Estonian Students' Union. Mart Aro, co-founder of Dream Apply N8. And Edgar Aronov, co-founder at Guana. Welcome you all. Each speaker will have a time for their own presentation, after which we will have our Q&A session. And let's move on to today's webinar topic, Higher Education and Remote Learning, Estonian Best Practices. Karl, Karl Kruzima is an associate professor of robotics engineering at the University of Tartu, in addition to teaching robotics and engineering at university level. Uh, Please uh, tell us, how did you become an, this uh, topic with uh, engineering with the robots? When was the first robot you hold in your hands? Ooh, uh, thinking when was the first robot? It, uh, I was actually quite old, I, I think as I was already at the university. And I must say, uh, university uh, then was uh, much different from what uh, university is today and uh, the methods that we deploy uh, right now uh, are also different from uh, when I was a student. So today I will be talking about uh, the possibility of teaching uh, robotics and uh, engineering as a, as a remote, um, uh, uh, through a re remote medium using e-learning. And uh, here, uh, I'm pretty sure that there are many people who would uh, say that uh, you cannot really teach robotics or engineering uh, purely by e-learning. And uh, in some many, many ways, these people are correct because they uh, 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 presume that engineering needs a hands-on approach. Uh, and they often regard uh, e-learning as something that happens through a web browser, so there is no hands-on activities. But what I will show you today is that that does not necessarily have to be true. And when uh, uh, the situation in March urged us to switch to e-learning, uh, the teachers at University of Tartu uh, in the field of robotics uh, were not uh, caught uh, by surprise. We were actually quite prepared. And we were prepared uh, part because uh, we have done uh, e-learning of engineering past. We've done e-learning electronics and e-learning uh, robotics. Also, uh, pretty much all of our courses uh, right now already have uh, some sort of an e-learning support. So our teachers are used to using those tools. And we have uh, started uh, even before this uh, crisis uh, in collaboration with some uh, European partners, developing even more e-learning tools for 
uh, engineering and robotics. So let, let me show some of these examples with you. Uh, for instance, uh, a couple of years ago, we did uh, an electronics MOOC, a massive open online course for general public in Estonia. And at first, each e-learning course, it would have uh, online tutorials, uh, videos, some interactive quizzes uh, for self-testing. But in, ad in addition to that, uh, the learners uh, could buy uh, a kit uh, that would consist some electronic devices, some measurement tools, and and they would have uh, tasks that they would solve at home using this kit. They would actually assemble electronic circuit boards, measure some of the physical characteristics, and then they would record uh, the solution and they would even get uh, instructor's approval. And the same model was also applied to a robotics course, but here instead of an electronics kit, the learners would have access to uh, a robot, a tiny little robot that they uh, they would either rent or purchase and play around at home. They would assemble the robot from scratch and they would uh, start writing different uh, code, different solutions for this robot. So it is possible to do e-learning and it is possible to do hands-on. And because of that experience, uh, right now, we at University of Tartu, due to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, quickly adopted this methodology and some other approaches to foster uh, practical assignments for our students. So first, uh, following the previous example, we do lend out some of university's equipment uh, so that students can use it at home to complete labs. Uh, and this equipment goes into rotation. Uh, uh, also, uh, we are being inventive. We, uh, we try to think what pieces of technology students already have at home. For instance, most of us have a smartphone at home, but how many of us think that a smartphone is really fancy sensor for robotics? It contains a, a compass, it, con it can measure uh, uh, its orientation and acceleration, and it can also uh, act as a video sensor, video camera. So by using a smartphone and integrating this into our engineering uh, tasks, we already have like a tiny piece of uh, uh, high-tech uh, robotic sensor at home. And thirdly, we've also connected some of our robots to internet so that students can, uh, when solving problems, upload their solution code to those internet connected robots and then observe uh, from, uh, from a web camera how that robot behaves. So e-learning is definitely a possibility and we're using this aggressively in, uh, at University of Tartu. And having these experiences has given us uh, the courage to do, do even more. So in, in this year, uh, we have started to collaborate within uh, a European-wide consortium called EIT Manufacturing. We have industry partners such as Siemens and Comau, but also other universities such as TU Wien uh, in Austria, TU, uh, TU Delft in uh, the Netherlands, uh, plus Alto University in Helsinki, just to name a few. And uh, we are together designing the next generation of digital learning materials for European workers, for European students, to foster exactly this, to foster uh, uh, interactive uh, high technology learning. So, and uh, with that, I would actually conclude my talk and thank you very much. Thank you, Karl. Karl Kruzama is an associate professor of robotics engineering at University of Tartu, and he's also a co-creator of free online courses on robotics and artificial intelligence. Now, thank you, Karl. For more information for those of you who are watching us, please go to uh, the Facebook and find us on page Education Nation and a group named Remote Learning Education Nation, or send us an e email to hello at educationnation.ee. Our next, next speaker is Marek Link, who is the Rector of Estonian Academy of Security Sciences. For the past 14 years, Marek has been working in the field of internal security education and training at the Estonian Academy of Security Sciences. As a Rector, his main areas of passion and development are dedicated to applying innovative training solutions like virtual reality, augmented reality and other digitally supported training solutions for policing, border guarding and crisis management related to training. For the past 10 years, he has been actively involved as an expert 
lecturer and trainer in many different internal security agencies and networks worldwide, like Frontex, DCAF, OCE, and CPOL, otherwise known as the European Police College. Hello, Marek. Hello. In these online times, are you looking towards Carl for some robotic help, or is it still possible to train a human police force online? Well, uh, I think we have some common topics with Carl, uh, and actually we are using robotics already in law enforcement, for example, in drones. But one thing what is really beneficial is that the uh, robots cannot get uh, coronavirus and will help us to stay and remain healthy. That's true. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, as you can see from the first slide, this is the new facility of Estonian Academy of Security Sciences, which is by its design a digital spaceship. And uh, unfortunately, we had to shut it down uh, on 16th of uh, March. And I think it was the case of every university that you only had couple of days to redesign the whole training and learning process as such. And uh, for more importantly, I think it is not so important that what kind of an app or a technology to use. We need to rethink the concept of learning. It is uh, what I always say that there is no such thing as e-learning. It's still learning, but it happens in digital environment. Um, so what comes to, I hope my Clicker works. Uh, just a second. And we'll have a next slide. Okay, here we go. So we are the only academy in Estonia to train all the law enforcement services. And uh, training for such kind of professions is a challenge on its own in physical environment as well. It requires skills, knowledge, and more importantly, also the values and, and the mindset. So our biggest challenge was that we couldn't skip uh, or, or postpone the learning because the agencies are working for a new recruits as, as we speak. So how to transform all the learning in electronic environment was a, was a big challenge. So I'm going to give you some hints and tricks what we come up with. and. Uh, I don't think that we will re return back to the uh, previous normality that we had before. So I give my tips and some recommendations. May I have the next slide, please? Good. So physical activity during a remote learning. And uh, I think that if you focus on what you can do instead of what can't you do, then the solutions are already available. And I think the biggest concept is uh, not only to give video lectures. I think the transformation should be that student becomes a teacher as well. So, for example, that uh, uh, staying fit, our students are creating their own training videos and sharing it with the others and, uh, and teachers as well. And very really interestingly, Getting more likes is more important than to get the letter A or B or C. Uh, what also works best is, is not to give them an exercise. Give them a challenge. Can you do five push-ups more than your teacher? That keeps your teacher fit and the student as well. And having a self-competition at home, uh, creating individual training plans by instructors, that is all possible. Next slide, please. For example, and, and make it fun, use gamification elements. Uh, this one is, for example, that it depends what is the first letter of your name. This is the exercise you have to do. And everyone who is watching this seminar today can already start doing it. Next one. And uh, this is also stay at home challenge. That is that you have to collect all the letters in the right order to complete your training. And you can record it, upload it, and share it with the others. So this is all about making it fun. But also, I think in this digital area we are living, the more important element of, of human being is the element of trust. 
And thinking about the admitting new students, and we also have really tough tests for them. One of them is, is physical. And what we are trying to pilot this year is that using, for example, Endomondo app uh, for running exercises or tests, that can we do it online? And But how do we know that it's not the dog who is running, but the person? That's the trust issue, what I mentioned before. But also that uh, using a robotics <laughs> on our website to ask uh, to answer the student questions performing online language tests and also that we do is a professional interview with a with a potential cadet to see if the value set and the mindset is the right one and the next one and uh, what 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 was actually performed a couple of weeks ago we had basically 12 hours to decide either to skip our academic anniversary event or not and i felt that uh, we should do something in that sense that if we do not honor our traditions, what I think every university academy has globally, it, I felt like giving up. So instead, we uh, also created a virtual anniversary event or birthday. And uh, I must say that uh, I got a letter from one of our old professors. It began with the title that, well, Marek, I was really skeptical. What are you up now? And I felt that this time I overcooked it. But in the end, the feedback was, this was amazing. We had so much fun. And this event was really sugar-free and alcohol-free. And what is also really good, that normally not many persons are remembering the birthday party that happened yesterday, you can always go back and watch the emotions times and times over again. And we had about 300 participants. It was really live, very human-like. And we have, haven't had so much uh, participants ever before. So what is also important, that the social connection is important. It's be human behind the computer. And uh, nowadays, we also are doing dissertation defenses online. We had a couple of them today. And amazingly, that the students are feeling more comfortable than starting uh, standing physically in front of the uh, uh, referees. But also that uh, all the graduation events are cancelled in Estonia. We are now thinking what will be the next crazy idea to perform our graduation ceremonies. Uh, next slide, please. So for five, uh, five of my favorite recommendations. Remain human. It's not transforming the physical environment to the digital environment. And uh, social connectivity is really, really important. What I mean by less is more. And I think this is the paradigmatical uh, shift. You don't have to give all the information in the world by video lecture. Instead, let them find information and 20 minutes uh, or chunks of learning are really good and to work very uh, work it work very well make it fun have emotions take time to speak with the students and also it is there are no impossible situations sometimes there are just unflexible teachers in the academy of estonia security sciences you have all the flexibility in the world but it's also remaining creative uh, creative and finally, don't be limited by the learning management systems what you are having right now. Go outside of the box. Why to use Moodle when you have Google? And that's pretty much it. The last slide says thank you. And uh, I hope that we still can open our facilities really soon. But for sure, the way we understand or understood learning in the digital environment will be surely different after we after reopening. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for those helpful thoughts. I'll make sure to try that letter challenge one day soon. Viewers, remember, if you have any questions, please head over to Education Nation YouTube channel or Facebook Live and post your question in the comments section there. 
Now we move on to Gerhard Locke, who is a lecturer of musicology and multimedia at the Baltic Film, Media, Arts and Communication School of Tallinn University. A German-born musicologist and composer who lives and works in Estonia since 2002. At the moment he is finishing his PhD in musicology and Estonian Academy of Music and Theatre. Since 2005 he has taught several subjects at Tallinn University, participated in the Estonian state, he allowed digital learning resources for high school compiling projects 2017-2018. Hello Gerhard. Hello everyone. As a musician, as a conductor myself, I can understand the difficulties of moving online with music studies. How has it been for you, Gerhard? Thank you for asking. For me, I have been uh, fine so far. I would love to make more qualitative music over the internet. The title of my presentation is Nobody is Alone, but self-sustainability is important. I present some examples by myself, colleagues and students from music, art, multimedia and dance as well as music teacher training and practice fields and curriculums at Tallinn University and Estonian Academy of Music and Theatre. Chosen online resources are the digital learning resources for high schools and music education, uh, ICT Facebook group. My personal experience is that screen sharing can be more direct and effective. Mimics can be also visual overload. Audio only rather supports to concentrate on the message. I very like the thought of one of our integrated arts, music and multimedia BA students. Quote, somehow this all has its own magic and I feel that a fairly muse appears. End of quote. I feel the same. Be creative. Use serendipitous moments like I did with my opening slide waterfall picture. In instrument and vocal teaching, clear tasks are crucial. Comparing student produced and improving video recordings based on prepared phonograms is working well. Too much self-criticism by students towards a perfect video recording must not be always positive. For solfeggio, beside worksheets for individual training, I let my students compose and record own dictations for peer-to-peer -peer training. By the way, I have done the same also in reclass situations before. For music history. Let's have a quick look at the Impressionism online material link. It's from the e-school bag. I gave my students a task to improvise Yes, please go ahead. Yes, I gave my students a task to improvise impressionistically using the pentatonic scale. And we already have listened to one of the examples. In the dance field, self-directed and motivated learners are successful. Those that see dance as mainly social activity may get problems. For shy dancers, self-video recording may be a challenge, but is reflective and encouraging. For experienced dancers, it can also be artistic output. High quality learning videos become especially important. in the music teacher training and practice field. We have already seen the impressionism example of the online resources issued in eSchoolback portal. I have been part of the compilers team in music. Let's have a quick look at the music education ICT Facebook group that shares a lot of useful online materials and news. For example, 
The Music Cater's Digital Music Education Solfeggio Portal will be translated now into Estonian. About this Facebook group, I very like that in this group one can offer triggers and get ideas that can be quickly realized by colleagues. For example, the idea to build an interactive map for Estonian folk music resources has been immediately started see in Padlet. Yeah, thank you. We have listened to the Jöhlechtme Hanemeng Goose Game as a historical recording from the Estonian folk music anthology. On my final slide, which already disappeared, I have some suggestions. Highly self-motivated learners should allow themselves more time for development. Motivation-losing learners should stay in regular video lessons for social reasons, concentrate on concrete independent work and details, and ask questions. Finally, collective mini pauses are welcome for all to stand up, walk around, make some gymnastics, tea and coffee. Be in a place you enjoy, for example in sunshine and fresh air, like today. Thank you. Aite. Thank you, Gerhard, very much, and especially I like that example of the Solfeggio uh, lesson in the river. Uh, thank you for, for this overview. If anyone has any questions for Gerhard or any other of uh, speakers, please submit them into the comment section in YouTube or Facebook Live, and we'll get to them in the Q&A session. Our next speakers, Eleri Pillirog, Mert Aro, Edgar Aranov. Our fourth speaker is Eleri, who is a chairperson of the Board of Federation of Estonian Students' Unions. In addition to the leading the largest student representative organization in Estonia, she is active in higher education policy making and acquiring a master's degree in law at the University of Tartu. Ellery has been involved with NGOs and representing students for almost seven years. Hello, Ellery. Hello, hello. Ellery, tell us, are you a fan of this e-learning phase we are currently in? I'm, I think, mostly a fan because it helps us to divide the work and school time at home. But I definitely miss the environment and the discussion that we got in the classroom. And uh, thus, I will actually start to uh, give you a little bit insight into how students are doing in the higher education right now and to share some experiences and tips for the future as well. So, uh, as we can see, there are different forms of study and I will give you a brief overview of what we had before. So there is this regular study form. Uh, where we have lectures and seminars on a daily basis. And studying is a regular part of our, of our everyday lives. But the focus is more on contact-based study, and this is meant to improve your study process. For instance, another study form is a block mode, and that is something that is definitely becoming a more custom. As we know, almost 80% of Estonian students are working right now, even full-time, and this uh, block mode study form gives us a lot of flexibility how to rearrange our work time and study time. But block mode usually takes place periodically or on the weekends. And this means that the time apart from studying is very flexible. And the focus is on independent work, which means you have more contact in shorter periods, but time after that is uh, up to you, how you will uh, use your study methods. What these uh, both study forms, rigorous study and block mode, have in common is the presence of e-learning. Higher education institutions use the basic communication through Moodle or study information system. 
to share mandatory materials, assignments, and so on. Some may even have gone beyond involving other programs. In conclusion, this is entirely dependent on the subject, as e-studies is not a mandatory form. If we talk about how study situation made a quick 180 turn, we saw forms of studying changing. The basis of it all now is e-studying uh, and e-study programs, all different kinds of distant learning methods. And these are a prerequisite to continue with the subjects. We definitely have a wide variety of platforms to use, but the key is being smart and using smart solutions and innovative methods together. What we also saw in some cases is that these two study forms kind of melting, whether it was quite literally that the two groups were put together to give out one subject or just the methods changed. Regular study still has to meet on work days and try to achieve that contact online, whereas block mode is focused on independent study and periodical work. E-learning is now our best friend. So, and this is the core value of distance study, as we think. Studies still have to continue as it would on a normal basis, such as cultivating practical work have to be done online together with lectures and seminars. This has definitely been hard on subjects not having any contact with e-learning before. Physical opportunities such as uh, the classroom moving to your home or your dorm room. Questions arise. Do you have a working computer? Do you have all the digital materials, possibility of video calls and so forth? E-learning definitely demands a larger device than just the mobile or smartphone, but it may have flexibility when having video calls or just reading. E-learning also can be done with endless solutions, but the key ingredient is to think smart. It is not best to overcomplicate things. Programs like Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Google Classroom are perfect for having those solutions as it would have in a normal classroom. Students definitely enjoy consistency in their e-learning. And thus we arrive to the conclusion that e-learning needs a focused timetable from the students waypoint as a weekly or monthly schedule, or even use Moodle, divide the topics into sections, for instance, into weeks, assign homework, reading and practical assignments and tests to make studying more enjoyable. Some teachers even use non-formal sections to have chat rooms, book reading recommendations and such. As e-learning becomes a best friend, the study process will be also easier to handle. But in cooperation with the higher education institutions and our active student unions who have held questionnaires about giving feedback to the first few months, we can bring out some first pros and cons. For, for, for possible, studies have thrived. So for instance, if the subject has had previous experience with e-learning, it was easier to move into distant learning now. But where contact with e-learning has not been the case, extensive changes to study regulations had to be made. This means that the changes had to be communicated well. If not, dissatisfaction from students would arise and also problems. We've also seen creative solutions to inoperable problems. Let's say that you need an experiment in physics or chemistry. How would you do it? I, I've seen that two teachers and students have uh, started to learn how to use this online methods very well. But there is also a downside. Workloads have increased tremendously. This means for teachers and students, but this is a big problem that the, the normal work I did when I was just studying is now more than I do. And also practical work still has barriers. Let's say for internships, uh, experiments, uh, all those practical things that you have to do in your subjects, there are still problems that cannot be solved. As a plus side, we've seen also very cool initiatives, for instance, students in helping to create an eff effective study environment. For instance, we've seen uh, coming together as a community, helping each other get uh, more devices or computers. We've seen a quick uh, response into digitalizing materials. But as an Estonian, I have to be a pessimistic. And we've also seen some worst examples of e-learning. For instance, uh, it is just a written work sent by you or to the student by email to just do an essay or questions and answers. 
but for final thoughts, I have some suggestions that would that I would like to give out. Students and teachers must come together to create the co-creation in the studies, and it has to be a teamwork. E-learning also must create new opportunities for future. Let's say that mo maybe most subjects don't have to be on uh, on a kind of environment in the physical world, but maybe online. And what I would like to most stress is that e-learning is just not the written work. There are so many solutions and possibilities that we have to use. And this, I would like to conclude these tips and experiences. Thank you, Ellery. For those of you watching us, if you're still not friend with Education Nation on website, go to Facebook and find us with the group Education Nation. And let's become connected and friends in that way. Next up is Mart Aro, co-founder of Dream Apply. Since 2004, Mart has established several organizations and companies in the area of education development. Student application management platform DreamApply.com was founded in 2011. Today, DreamApply is used by 250 universities from 35 countries, serving millions of users a year. Hello, Mert. Hello. I remember when I applied to universities years ago, the process was always slightly different and changing. Well, I also did this in different countries, but is the situation today helping along the move to digital or is it something that would happen naturally anyway? So first of all, I think uh, a lot of uh, universities have already moved to some kind of digital form uh, in admissions. Uh, but uh, of course, there still are universities that are still accepting students uh, on paper and uh, using maybe some more simplistic uh, way to to uh, manage the admission process. But um, of course, with, uh, with Reapply, we have looked at um, how to make this uh, communication between the university and the student as convenient and, and as automatized as possible. So let's uh, maybe look a bit uh, into, into the Dreamapply. Uh, first of all, Dreamapply, as uh, Lehari already said, uh, it's been around for quite some time and now about three of the, the ten oldest universities in the world are using DreamApply, for example, University of Siena, which is uh, from 1240. But uh, let's look at why DreamApply is relevant at all. So firstly, if you look about 30 years ago, almost all admissions was done on paper. Today, uh, most universities have an online application form uh, available and so it's convenient for students to to fill in the data online but um, uh, when you look into the back of the uh, of what's going on actually in the back end then um, uh, the reality is that admissions offices work has become a lot more complex than it was uh, 30 years ago and uh, this is because uh, we're doing actually uh, very many different things. Um, for example, if we look at uh, today's reality in international students' admissions, then uh, this is the typical picture that we see. There is about 27 different things that an international student needs to do to enter uh, the door of a university. And uh, on the university side, there is around 50 different things that needs to be done uh, to get the student to, to step in the door of the university. And of course, uh, to do this manually is, is a lot of work. So what we have achieved with Dreamapply is that um, uh, thanks to the automatization, we have managed to cut about 60% of the admin work uh, for the universities and increase uh, the international candidates numbers between 50 to 100%. And of course, uh, this, uh, this pays off very quickly because um, if you talk about international students, then uh, getting international students is... Um, is quite expensive for universities. If, if you consider going to an international study fair, it can cost uh, easily 10,000 euros. And um, uh, with uh, tools that can, can help uh, to make uh, the recruitment more successful, uh, it's, it's possible to get a lot bet better outcomes. So um, why is internationalization in, in general at, at all important? So there, this is an example of uh, University of Helsinki that's also working with our, our platform. Uh, it's important because um, when, we, uh, when we want to make the learning experience better for the students, then 
going to study abroad is one of the easiest ways to do it. Um, and, uh, and this is the reason why we started to develop DreamApply in the first place. And of course, we started from the student's perspective. Uh, so how can we make the life uh, of an international student, of, of a person who wants to do something uh, totally unique that, that most people don't dare even to consider to go to study abroad? Um, what are the bottlenecks from these people's perspective when they uh, are considering this, uh, this uh, quite uh, tough challenge? And uh, thanks to this, I believe um, that we have looked at the students' perspective, we have achieved to, uh, these great results. And um, here is a slide of, uh, of some of the examples of uh, success stories, what we have achieved so far. So for example, uh, we're running Estonian and Lithuanian and Hungarian national systems uh, for, for various student recruitment processes. And um, around 250, Universities in total are, are working with, with DreamApply platform today. And for them, of course, it was not uh, very difficult to switch to remote work uh, because uh, DreamApply is working fully, fully uh, online. So if you look at uh, what DreamApply is working on, then uh, we have taken a very simple approach um, to have a positive user experience so the person would feel convenient when they're served in an online setting, and at the same time to have a very high efficiency to de decrease the workload from the university admissions offices. And um, this is, of course, quite different from, from what you see in many other um, systems that are used for this purpose. Uh, this is the Estonian national system, um, how it looks like at the moment. So go, go and check it out. Estonia.dreamapply.com is the link where you can find it. And uh, a few examples of why uh, digitizing of education can be very, very beneficial. Uh, we've looked at uh, statistics of, um, of uh, uh, how the international, well, let's say, why the international students want to go to study in Estonia at all. And um, thanks to looking at the statistics, we found out that um, uh, there uh, was a very clear reason uh, why the students uh, considered Estonian universities. And uh, this was um, that uh, they liked the, the quality of service that they got from the universities, uh, the clearliness of the admission process. And uh, be because of the cooperation between the Estonian government and Reapply, uh, this is what we have achieved um, during the past, um, uh, let's say, uh, nine years in Estonia. So uh, moving from uh, a few thousand international candidates to, to um, almost uh, sevenfold uh, the, the result that was before cooperation. Uh, just a few examples of tools that are available for the universities uh, in DreamApply. So for example, um, today in, in the coronavirus time, it's very important for universities to be able to do online marketing. And of course, for this, it's very important to understand uh, w what marketing works and what doesn't. So for example, historically, you saw that uh, here is a budget for doing marketing. So we kind of pour it into a big black box and then we shake it heavily and then we kind of see what kind of comes out of it. And we have no idea what is connected with each other and why the students are coming to us at all. Um, but uh, with the proper marketing tracking tools where you can see exactly why a certain university uh, is uh, attracting students, which campaigns are, are useful for the university. Uh, this allows to, to pinpoint uh, the investments that the universities are making. Uh, then, of course, uh, what you want to look at is also uh, how, to, what, how our work looks like in general as a university. So there are certain types of statistics that can be very useful to plan the work of the university better. This concrete graph shows us uh, when the candidates are coming in. And um, what we usually see that is that there is a lot of activity just before the deadline. Of course, the final hours before the deadline are the most popular. And uh, at the same time, then we can see also how quickly we are responding to the students. So for example, another graph that we have looked at uh, showed that um, if we reply to an international student with um, within three weeks uh, of the moment of application, then it's two times likely that they will come to study to our university 
then when we delay the response uh, uh, further, let's say if we would re respond in two months, it's two times less likely that uh, that they will actually come to study to our university. And um, yeah, just uh, some fancy stuff as well. So there is a machine vision uh, system used to uh, look at uh, the documents that the students have submitted and, and find errors in the uh, documents that have been submitted. So uh, just to make uh, life nicer and easier for the universities. I hope it was interesting for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It was indeed. We have just one speaker left until we begin with Q&A, so please submit them in the comment section in YouTube or Facebook Live and we will get to them in the Q&A session. Our final speaker today is Edgar Aronov, co-founder at Guana. Guana founded in 2014, started by building a global community of researchers where they can build projects together and distributing grants on behalf of governments and organizations. As of today, Guana is also hosting online challenges and hackathons worldwide. Hello, Edgar. Hello, thank you. With an emphasis on building a global community of researchers, I imagine you were already very much online before this year's events. How has the crisis affected Guana and your work? Absolutely. Uh, our goal from the beginning has been to help research and innovation efforts to move faster through digital tools. And in the past few months, uh, we've seen that it has been accelerating uh, very strongly. So it has been very useful for us. Uh, and to, to kick it off, uh, I will give an overview in my talk uh, what Guana is, uh, how the current crisis has impacted us, and also uh, what has been the role of Estonian government in helping us to grow Guana. And without further ado, what is Guana? So uh, we founded Guana six years ago, uh, and uh, the first product was where researchers could build projects together, which would allow uh, them to work together globally. And, and uh, we added to that a tool that will allow governments and organizations to distribute grants. Because on one side, we had a community of scientists. On the other side, we, we had uh, governments and organizations who were looking to fund them. And with that, we provided all necessary uh, infrastructure for the whole process, and, and uh, which include uh, managing proposals, evaluations, uh, and, and, uh, and finding the researchers. Uh, where we are right now is that uh, now we're also doing online hackathons and challenges. So the market has gone a bit more wider, and we see the demand for it uh, is quite strong, especially now. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, one of the, the, the most no known projects that we have done is the MBR space, space settlement challenge, which was run by the government of Dubai. And we distributed a bit over half a million of dollars, uh, of grants, uh, within one month. And which, uh, and what made it so special was that usually if you distribute grants, the whole process takes you around six to 12 months. Uh, but, uh, but we were able to pull it off within just one month and have participants from uh, over 170 universities and almost 50 different countries. Uh, now let's move on to some numbers. So how the current crisis has affected us in numbers is that, as you can see that starting from March, uh, things have accelerated quite a lot. And uh, we've seen mostly we've seen demand from uh, online hackathons and also online challenges that the organizers who were using before doing these events in physical space are doing it now online. And a, a more detailed look uh, into these events is that uh, uh, during the past two months, we have uh, hosted online hackathons from over 25 countries uh, with, with a quite uh, high diversity. Uh, we had uh, hackathons from Germany, from Africa, from, from the United States, from Estonia, of course. And, and, uh, and some of the benefits that we have seen, uh, the, uh, our partners have seen is that uh, 
that if you remove the participation limits uh, and you can do it globally and you can also uh, and, and the whole project will cost you a lot less then uh, you can create a lot more value uh, than you could have with physical uh, events uh, and with this past two months we have uh, right now we have we have received over 5000 solutions that are related to fighting the current covid 2019 uh, virus so uh, it's very we're very pleased to see that everyone's adapting to it and finding solutions and uh, uh, so uh, could we have captured this uh, this trend so well without the Estonian government? Uh, the answer is probably not, because uh, how it all started off for us in March was that uh, Accelerate Estonia is a, is a startup-minded innovation project initiated by Estonian Ministry of Economic Affairs and uh, Accelerate Estonia, Guana and Coras48 launched together the first Hack the Crisis online hackathon. And uh, the hackathon was quite easy. So you, you, you submit solutions to, the, to coronavirus. And what happened after that was that uh, it, uh, it exploded quite a lot in popularity. And uh, within pretty much after it was finished, we started to receive uh, a lot of requests to run uh, hack the crisis in in other regions so uh, so uh, although uh, our tools were ready and we also did uh, some uh, reach out from from ourselves uh, the the effort uh, from the Estonian government to launch initiatives such as the, uh, such as uh, hack the crisis has been extremely valuable for us And to uh, also to wrap it up is that the, what we uh, what we usually offer is that uh, the cost for running an online hackathon and online challenge is usually around 300, uh, 350 euros to 3,500 euros. Uh, however, with the current uh, with the current crisis, we uh, we provide our tools uh, for free, which tackle this uh, the coronavirus. And additionally, we have uh, we have launched uh, a program named Guana for Academy, where universities can invite organizations or governments to propose their problems for students to hack them, and and uh, we provide all the necessary tools to uh, to fulfill this event, which includes collecting ideas, evaluating them, and making them public later. And this is free for all universities. And uh, that's it from uh, from my side. Uh, to uh, also to uh, as a last ending verse is that uh, online challenges are on the rise, and it's showing us all that how powerful online events can be that are not limited by physical space. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar, and thank you to all of you speaking today. Now it's time for the Q and A. Remember that you can still ask a question in the comment section on YouTube or Facebook Live. During this time, we are asking the question. And the first question goes to Carl. The question is for you regarding the state of our robotic studies. How do you feel robotics in Estonia is doing when compared to the rest of the world? Uh, we have nothing to be ashamed of, is the modest Estonian answer. Uh, but uh, to be uh, uh, even more precise, I think Estonia is doing rather well. I think robotics in Estonia is like uh, Skype uh, many years ago, 20 uh, years ago. Uh, we have startups working in robotics. Our universities are equipped with latest robotics technology. Our students are interested and motivated to learn robotics. So we have robotics uh, on, uh, we're tackling robotics on all sides and we're being successful. Thanks. Um, Edgar, how much is Guana working with universities today? Quite a lot. So uh, we are helping universities to run online challenges and we've uh, pretty much from the day that we have started, we have been in close 
uh, touch with universities from all over the world to help them uh, to uh, work better uh, together. So uh, yeah, we are very close with, it, with them. Ellery, within the situation we are today, what is your encouraging message to the rest of your colleagues in the world? Well, colleagues can be, I think, for students and teachers. Uh, the message is uh, to be more creative, uh, definitely to stay strong. This is a tough situation for us all. I think this is something that we have not seen for a long time. But use that time to be creative uh, and also to work together. I think co-creation is, is a key word as well here. Thanks. A question to Carl. Carl, with all of these innovations, the person writing us imagines that uh, you also could have many plans for the future. But the question is, is the situation now an inspiration or a welcome challenge? I think it's a, it's a great inspiration and it also brings a lot of motivation because uh, e-learning had a boom, let's say, 20 years ago. Everybody started suddenly with the onset of high-speed internet talking about how all the learning is going to migrate into the online environment. And as we know, it happened only in some areas and it happened only in certain scenarios, but we are not fully uh, in a digital learning environment. And I would say some people already started to say that, well, it was just a fad, that e-learning has, uh, has it had its day and now we're past it and the conventional university conventional learning will persist mm. and what this COVID situation has reminded us that e-learning is very important and it's needed and it's efficient and uh, and uh, now a new wave of professors are agreeing to it and also students thanks Mark a question from a student uh, I think you briefly touched this with the speech but you can emphasize the message the person writes you said some very nice words about the ceremony you had recently would you consider moving the opening or any other ceremony in the future to be online even when the time changes um, if this came from the student, obviously he or she hasn't uh, attended our graduation ceremonies yet. And these are the <laughs> sophisticated uh, ceremonies. Everybody's wearing their uniforms. I uh, think uh, uh, this year it's different. But uh, next year I would rather go back to the major concert halls and have a real ceremony. But uh, With an online I touch maybe. <laughs> Yeah, with an online touch, I, I, I cannot get rid of it anymore, I guess. But uh, we'll figure something out. Uh, we will let you know, my dear student. Very good, thank you. Uh, Gerhard, one short question to you as well. Uh, for doing uh, music online and uh, teaching music online is now uh, really a challenge around the world because especially teachers need to somehow help the players, musicians or whatsoever. In a nutshell, what do you think will be the advantage or a next step towards the music, music education because of the current situation, because we need to do it online. What is the benefit for the musical music history? Uh, shortly speaking, I would say that we all really understand that we become learners. Teachers are learners and students. And we are finding more and more interesting material on the internet we are putting our own materials onto the internet and we learn more and more to collaborate, to uh, trust each other, to uh, trigger ideas and thoughts and then realize them immediately as I al already brought as an example. So I see it as a big challenge, of course, to make music over the internet uh, and dancing over the internet uh, is uh, there are some systems with low la latency, LoLa system. And before the shutdown, BFM started to build up the, the system in collaboration with Toko Arts Academy. And Music Academy already has it. So I would love to uh, have it at BFM already implemented. 
So there are also possibilities to make uh, quality music over the internet. Very nice. Uh, thank you. And a question to Edgar. By dealing with multiple researchers around the world, uh, the questioner here is pointing out that security and privacy probably is a very important for Guana. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, this is very important for us and, and we take it seriously. Uh, uh, in Guana, uh, it's the user who, uh, who provides their uh, idea or the solution has always control of the inputs. So uh, they can at any time remove their project if they want to. And, and, uh, and, uh, and we make sure that it will be, it will be supporting the, the collaboration because if the privacy will be a, a bit weak, then it, it will work against to everything we are building right now. Mert, besides the work you do and what you just described, you are also one initiator in Education Nation. The closing words for you when hearing all your colleagues and after the presentation of what you did, what would be your encouraging message to our listeners and people who are watching us today? Uh, your microphone though needs to be switched on, please do that. All right, now we hear you, please go ahead. Uh, I would say um, we have all the resources and the knowledge to improve the quality of learning significantly uh, for everybody in the world and to enable access to high quality learning experience to everybody globally. Let's make this happen together. Thank you. Thank you and thanks to all of our speakers. This is all for today. Our next webinar takes place next Thursday, the 7th of May at the same time. Next week's topic is Estonian best practices of remote learning in CLIL, which stands for Content and Language Integrated Learning. Thank you all for tuning in and watching. For more information for future webinars, follow us on social media at Education Nation and join our open Facebook group Remote Learning Education Nation, where you can also suggest topics for future webinars. And remember, if you are not yet part of Education Nation, you can be. Join us in Facebook. Take care. See you next week.